to zip or not to zip? <laughs> that is the question. I t hope that was dramatic enough. I always wanted to be a dramatic actor. My mom told me I should be a computer scientist, so here I am. Um, our work is, well, Ethan gave a nice introduction. It's about effective resource usage on real-time compression uh, with my co-authors from Haifa. Let's start with a bit of a boring slide, but I have to do it because I have to put you in the scope of the talk. Uh, our work is about compression, but not every scenario of compression. It's about real-time compression, and it's, our motivation was for compression for primary data on enterprise storage. Uh, it really brings a lot of benefits to the table, and the challenge here is to insert it seamlessly to the storage system, and very importantly, with little to no effect on the performance. Another uh, boring topic it is, is I have to tell you what compression we studied. So this kind of generalizes to just about any method of compression, you, compression you'll use. Uh, we chose one to, that, that's a good representative as any. It's a Zlib a library. It's probably the most popular compression code out there. Every time you run gzip, that's what's running behind it. It employs two methods, very uh, central methods in compression. One is the lempel ziv compression, which basically looks for repetitions in your stream and replaces, well, takes long repetitions, replaces them with short pointers. That'll compress the data. The other is Huffman encoding. Huffman encoding exploits the non-uniformity of characters in your stream and tries to encode the popular ones uh, with a short, shorter encoding than the non-popular ones and hence gain space. So that's the realm and now we can get to the interesting stuff. So Addison mentioned this is all about estimating compression ratios. And this slide is going to talk about why, why are we actually interested. So to zip or not to zip, that is the question. Uh, compression does not come for free. There's overheads that you add here, mainly CPU, also memory. Uh, and in some cases, it's not a, a big deal. But in some, this is really significant, specifically storage systems that have a high ratio between disks uh, to compute uh, to CPUs, uh, that may be a problem, definitely, if you have SSDs in the background. So um, it's OK to pay the overhead if you're gaining something. And, and you can gain a lot from compression. But sometimes you're just not gaining anything. And if it has nothing to do with what you're doing, it's the data. It's them. Uh, if the data is encrypted, if the data is a JPEG, there's nothing to compress there, and, and there's no real good reason to, to do this effort. To make it even more acute, I'll put in a, a graph here that has the performance of Zlib running on different compression ratios. And what you'll see is, well, zero being close to zero is the most, the best compression. The worst compression is close to one. And you see that the running time gets worse as the compression ratio gets worse. So you're, you're working the hardest when you're gaining nothing. And this is even more motivation to, to really avoid compressing incompressible data. That's the goal here. OK, so that's one reason to do the estimation. Uh, there's other motivations that are very interesting to us. Specifically, one that's, that's crucial is evaluation and sizing. So the story here is, well, compression ratio amounts to the number of disks you're going to have to put in your back end. And the number of disks amount to money. And money is important. So if you have a good estimation of the compression ratio, you can evaluate whether you want to invest in compression, whether it's worth it. Uh, once you've made that decision to actually uh, go and invest in compression, then comes sizing. How many disks do you actually go and buy them? Uh, so, so this, if we had good estimation, we could answer these, these questions nicely. OK, what's out there? What's been done out there, actually? So 
not too much those rules of thumb that, that are prevalent and are, at times they're very good actually. And a close neighbor is let's look at file extensions and deduce from there. And this is a pretty good solution. The problem is it's not always accurate. Sometimes it's rather inaccurate. And it's not always available. Suppose I'm a block storage, I don't see the, the extensions. Um, the other option is to look at the actual data. So I want to look at the bits and the bytes that's, that are lying below them. What we can do first is just let's scan the whole thing and compress it. But this kind of beats the purpose. We, we're trying to save time or, or resources here. Uh, but here's another idea. Let's look at the prefix of the chunk, file, what have you. Compress that and deduce about the rest. And that's, it. that's not a bad idea either. We'll even get back to that uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, but the problem is there's no real guarantee here. How much to read? What do you do with it? You actually have no guarantee on, on how close you're going to get to what's actually going to be compressed there. So the uh, question is, can you read something else, some other part of the data that will give you a good clue? And the answer is that, uh, well, today there's no established method for estimating compression ratios rather than just compressing. And moreover, there's even a paper, Rashkodnikova et al. from 07. It's a paper from the realm of property testing. And what they did there is they gave a proof, analytical proof, that you cannot accurately estimate LZ77 compression unless you're reading practically all of the data at hand, which takes a lot of the options off the table. Okay, that's about existing solutions. Let's get to our work now. So our work presents two solutions in two granularities. We have a macro scale solution and a micro scale solution. The macro looks at large volumes. It's gigabytes, it's terabytes. A uh, micro will look at single writes to the system. This is in the order of kilobytes. In the macro, the time to compress is very large. It could be hours to compress the whole volume you're talking about. Uh, and the estimation, well, if that runs in a few minutes, that's awesome. So that, that would be a great improvement. On the other hand, in the micro, the whole thing takes milliseconds. So anything you're going to do has to be ultra quick here. You, you can't really invest a lot of time in the estimation. Uh, as a result, on the micro scale, we actually come up with very good solid guarantees uh, that we can achieve. On the micro scale, we're heuristic. We're going with the best effort. Uh, we have two methods because we have multiple use cases, they kind of complement each other. So what is the macro good for? It's good for avoiding compression altogether on large volumes. Now there's more than just the benefit of CPU here. Compression has to involve redirection. So once you've decided not to compress, why do all the, the whole redirection, the whole structure in there? So, so there's a big benefit in making these decisions at large volumes. Also, because of the accuracy, you can do the evaluation and sizing. You can really get that from the macro solution. On the micro solution, this is good for on these fly decisions. So suppose I don't have the data in advance. I just see the rights. I don't have information about the data. Or perhaps I have information about the data. I know it's compressible, but there's islands of non-compressible data that I want to fish them out and not compress them. So these are the two. Uh, to solutions. The outline to, for the rest of the talk is going to be dive into each one of them, the macro and the micro. Uh, then I'll go a bit about putting it together, the big picture. And finally, I'm going to hold a poster session. OK, so into the macro scale. Um, again, this is a large volume of input we're talking about, of a block storage volume, file system. We want to estimate with accuracy guarantees. I'm going to hark back to the accuracy guarantees. So, so maybe if I would have asked most of you in the car, what would you suggest? I think most of you would come up with the following framework. 
Let's do sampling. Let's choose M random locations, average the compression ratio for all of them, and that's it. That's your estimation. And basically, that's what we do. So it, it looks very simple, but in fact, it's not so simple. Uh, unfortunately, or actually fortunately, otherwise we wouldn't be able to write a paper about it. But uh, it, it's not so simple for, well, well how about these questions? What, what is location here? What is the thing you're reading? How do you compute the compression ratio of a location? What, what is it exactly? And how do I make a guarantee out of this? And I, I'm saying it's not simple because I can come up with examples of very natural ways to compress, uh, to do the sampling that will be grossly uh, er erroneous in estimation. So, so you can, there are pitfalls here, and, and at the postdoc session, I'm willing to go into such, uh, but, but not in the talk. Okay, I, I'm gonna start with an example of something that actually is very simple. Uh, so what, if the compression was done in the following way. Take the big input out there and just slice it to fixed size chunks. Um, and now each fixed size chunk is compressed independently. So each one has their nice output there, uh, various compression ratios. This is really simple because all you have to do is sample chunks. This is what you sample. Sample chunks, you average the compression ratio, the math will come along nicely. This is a good solution. Problem is that when we're actually doing the compression that we're interested in, say we're taking zlib over a 10 gigabyte file. You have a big input, you have a big output, hopefully smaller, uh, but there's no clear cutting in there. That, so, so what can you do here? And, and what I'll show is that you can do stuff here, uh, you can make the sampling correctly and get the guarantees. Now somebody should be shouting out there in their mind, well, hey, 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 you said five minutes ago that there's a paper saying this is impossible. Now you're claiming it's possible. So, so what's wrong here? Well, the paper indeed says it's impossible and the paper is correct. It's impossible for lempel ziv 77 as was written by lempel ziv in 77. This is not the case for Zlib. Zlib was written a bit differently. So, what, what happens here? First, the quote is in order. I, I'm quoting Albert Einstein. In theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice, they are not. This is a very fitting quote here. Because what happens is when you go to implement, uh, you, you have to take care of all these nagging little things, like you have to consume little memory, or don't go crazy with the memory, or you don't want your pointers to be lo too large if you're pointing too far backwards. And all of these cause you to keep some locality limits to what you're doing. And these locality limits are what allow us to get over the impossibility results. So what do we actually do? We're sampling bytes. This is what we're sampling. Actual bytes out of the whole huge uh, volume out there. Uh, and for each byte, we'll do the following. We're going to define a contribution of a byte as the compression ratio of its locality. What is locality? So locality, we define it as the set of locations that might has a potential of influencing how this byte that we chose is going to be written in the output. That's the locality of a single byte. And now we can talk about compression ratio of this locality. Let's, so suppose I have that blue area, that's the locality of the, the one byte. The compression ratio of this area is the compression ratio we attribute, or the contribution we attribute to the single byte. We're gonna do this for all the bytes that we chose and find their co relative, uh, respective contributions. I'm, uh, uh, the, the picture has little different say, sizes and shapes to the localities, and this is on purpose because what happens is the localities are not of fixed size. It depends on the actual data. Uh, typically what, what really dictates this is all sorts of internal buffers being filled out inside uh, the compression engine, and typically comp data that compresses well will have very large locality as opposed to data that doesn't compress. So that was a hint to what, what it actually looks like. 
So how do we get a guarantee here? And here's a very quick analysis uh, sketch. The sketch of the proof will say, we're going to prove that the overall ratio is an average of the contributions, what we define now, on all of the bytes, on all of the system. Uh, and once we prove this, we're in very good shape. That was 10, right? OK. Once we prove this, uh, we're OK because we're very good at sampling for averages. This is something that statisticians do all the time. We can use mathematical results there. So you only have to prove this fact and you get your sampling uh, guarantees for free. The sampling guarantees look something like this. It's, there's an equation that we have a confidence, we have accuracy. Uh, the accuracy is an additive error. Uh, you plug in the desired uh, confidence and accuracy and you get the sample size that you want. Important point here is the sample size has no relation to the volume size. So if you're testing a gigabyte, a terabyte, or a petabyte, it's the same number of samples and the same guarantee. Of course, 5% of a petabyte is not 5% of a gigabyte, but in terms of compression ratio, it's the same guarantee. We also know that uh, the tests uh, are distributed normally around the actual result, uh, meaning that most of the time we get very close to the real result. If I say 5% guarantee, it means that usually I'll be within 1% or 1.5% and not within 5%. So what have we done with this? We have an actual tool running this. It was written in C. It's multi-threaded. Uh, it implements two compression methods. One is the IBM real-time compression. Uh, this was the original motivation of this work. And then we, we did this also for Zlib on objects, on full objects. Uh, that, those are the implementations. Uh, tested on real data. Uh, here's a neat example. We ran it on a volume of 3.2 terabytes. Uh, it ran in 73 seconds, got less than half a percent of an error. Uh, exhaustive run took almost four hours. So the gap is really tremendous here. Uh, if you're interested, this is an actual tool out there. It's called the IBM Compressimator. You have to Google Compressimator, you'll find it. Uh, it'll give you estimations on your data to what you can get using uh, the real-time compression on the IBM products listed. Okay, that was the macro, now the ma micro. So now it's single writes, it's small writes, and we want to quickly give a recommendation. We have to be very, very fast. We don't want to read the entire chunk. And in this case, the locality is much bigger than the actual write. So the impossibility actually holds and I can get no guarantees. Uh, which is why I'm going to be heuristic here. So two options. One is the prefix estimation I talked about. So say we, we have an 8K block, stop at 1K after compressing 1K, and just see how you've done so far. It's good, you continue. It's bad, you just throw it away and you copy. Uh, this is very good for compressible data because there's hardly, there's zero, zero overhead here. You're just doing a stop, check, continue, that's it. Zero overhead. Uh, it's not so nice for non-compressible data because you're throwing away all the work you did. Uh, it's also problematic for data that changes in the middle. And given those cons, we try to shoot for another solution. So we came up with a method that we call the heuristics method, which basically does the following. It collects a set of indicators about the chunk and then makes a decision, either compress, don't compress, or we can also say about stuff that, hey, this is better off just doing Huffman encoding without LZ encoding. So that's another bonus that we get. Uh, this is a drawing of the algorithm. I'm not going over it. I just wanted a nice drawing on my slide. Uh, but we have uh, the indicators, core set size. Uh, I won't go into that byte entropy, which is a very natural one to use here. And we have something on pairs of characters, the distribution of pairs. That's a third indicator down. We want to be very speed, so we employed a number of techniques. 
sampling. We are not doing the indicators on all of the chunks, just on samples. We collect the samples adaptively. We stop as soon as we feel that statistically there's enough significance there so we can trust the results that we see. And we're doing lazy evaluation, uh, meaning that we first collect the first indicator, try to stop, get a good decision. If we can't, we continue on and on. So we're trying to stop as early as possible. So let's look at results. We have running time here, and it was tested on a large collection of data that, well, fairly large collection of data. Uh, and what you see is a drawing that depicts the running time of different methods as a function of compression ratio. So the top one you already are, should be familiar with. This is the running time of actually doing the full compression. This is the green line. Uh, the blue line is what happens if you only compress the first 1K of the chunk. So this would be the overhead of the prefix compression. And at the bottom, you have the running time of the heuristics method. As you see, the heuristics method is very, very quick for very compressible data and for very uncompressible data uh, at the edge. In the middle, it's having a harder time deciding. It's collecting more indicators. This is why you have the humps on the line there. So basically, what, what are we doing with this? We're doing a time versus compression uh, trade-off. And for example, some uh, tests that we ran showed us the following example. Uh, we, with the prefix compression, we managed to reduce the CPU utilization to just 74% of the full one. Uh, and there was a price. We increased the capacity by 2.2%, the overall capacity. On the same data set, the heuristics method managed to reduce it further down to 65% at a cost of 2.3% capacity increase. These are good trade-offs in general. Uh, they can get better depending on the data. They can get worse depending on the data. So it really depends on the data set. There's no definitive thing here. Uh, which brings us to the last slide, uh, which is putting it all together. Uh, so what do we do with all this array of techniques that I showed you? Uh, this is what, uh, how we see it as the big picture. Whenever it's applicable, use the macro scale. So before you're starting to deal with compression, if the data is there, use the macro scale because the gap there is amazing and the, the guarantees are very good. You can really learn a lot from it. After this operation, whether possible or not, you start working according to what you've actually seen in the data. So the data, I have a color code here. Green is compressible, red is incompressible. Obvious choices. Uh, and we have three different scenarios we're looking at. Well, if most of the data is compressible, so it's almost all green, use the prefix estimation because this is the case where it's actually cost costing you nothing. You run as fast as actually compressing, and then the uh, prefix estimation might be able to catch some of the red points that are out there on the edge. Uh, on the other hand, if you're starting to see a significant amount of non-compressible data in your data set, then you're better off with the heuristics. Uh, the heuristics are faster, uh, the fastest in this case. Uh, and then you, you'll, be, you'll be able to, to get a nice trade-off and, and maybe see the trade-offs that we've seen. Uh, the more incompressible data, the more the trade-off will be in your favor. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, what happens if almost all of the data is non-compressible? In this case, we say just turn the compression off totally. Forget about it. Uh, there's no point in running the heuristics because that's just an overhead. You don't want that at all. So uh, what we say is just turn off the compression and now use the macro scale occasionally, once in a while, uh, just run it for one minute at night and you can figure out whether something has changed and now you need to start turning the heuristics on uh, or the prefix on or what have you. So this is the main scheme and uh, that's about it and I'm right on time. Very nice, thank you.
time for some questions. Akshadara NEC Labs. Uh, so you showed that you save about 33 to 40% CPU. Uh, but in terms of the execution time, it goes down by a much larger factor. So uh, how does that happen? Like, where's the bottleneck? Uh, what do you, uh, uh, the, execution? Well, the execution time for compression. So, so what you saw is uh, the actual graph was very sterile. You just saw for each compression ratio uh, what, what we saw down there. Uh, but the results on the overall trade-off, that was take the whole mixture of the large data set that had all sorts of combinations of, of compressible data and non-compressible data. So definitely, if the data is compressible and you're running a heuristics, you're just paying a penalty. You're doing the heuristics, then deciding, OK, this is compressible. Continue and compressing, that's just an overhead. Uh, so it depends on the data set itself. Uh, this was for one single data set. Take another, you'll get different numbers. OK, thank you. Uh, hi, Michael Condit, NetApp. I just wanted to point out that your results are also dependent on uh, which compression algorithm you're using. Uh, uh, Zlib is a very old compression program. Um, there are ones that do almost as well in compression ratio and are th three to six times faster, like LZO and Snappy. Right, I'll even mention that uh, some of these have a built-in prefix estimation mechanism. So Snappy, for instance, or LZ4 do this, they start skipping as they run along, and then the prefix estimation is, is in, the, in these methods. I'll mention in, in that setting that not all of them have a nice locality, which make them harder to estimate. And specifically, deduplication is one that has no locality at all. And it, uh, therefore, you cannot do the macro scale estimation on it. Um, so I'm not sure I understand you. You first you're compressing, then you're encrypting, or so you, you have to do that order. Do the other order. It doesn't work. Okay. So uh, so your question is on the macro scale. Uh, right. Exactly. Well, both. I mean, basically, if you have an encrypted disk, you know, are there any? I can't think of any good technique, but there are many other kinds of transformations that may be applied. How does that impact? I have actually no idea. That's a good, a good point, but never, never touched on that. 